Oh
uh, pastor has asked me to take the offering again this Sunday, and uh, I just want to uh, kind of reflect on what I said last week. Um, God gave us, God gives us opportunities. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. He, he, he gives you opportunities to do good, and uh, and it's your choice to do that. And um, and then. Basically, uh, last month I said we had an opportunity. It was the last Sunday of the month, the last opportunity to give for that month um, into something that we all believe in, that we all have faith in. That you know we're a family together. And uh, this Sunday happens to be the first Sunday of the month. So again, we're presented with an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings back to the Lord and to support what we all are here about. And that's um, furthering the kingdom of God, um, being unified as a family, and uh, so so keep that in mind today as, as you give. That it's the first Sunday of the month, and and the further everybody knows, the further you get into a month, the harder it is to do anything. So the best time to take care of something is right off the get go. So anyway, keep that in mind today, and uh, we'll just ask the Lord bless you today. Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord Father. To, to give back to you what you've given to us, Lord Father. And I pray that you would just bless the people today, Lord Father, as they give out of out of what they need to support their families with and, and everything, Lord Father. But we know that, that the first step is, Lord Father, you taking care of us. We leave that in your hands today, Lord God. We ask that you would take care of us, Lord God. I pray that you would bless these people, Lord Father. We thank you for this opportunity, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
never cease to uh, progress. Good to see you, man. Um, you that don't know who this is, it's Chris Timmons, and I can't. Man, girls. Wow. Um, years ago, Chris worked with us, and we, uh, Lisa and I refer back to some of the ones that have worked in our children's department. Never once do we refer back without talking about Chris. He was, uh, you guys may not know him, but he, he is a, he is a kid magnet. And uh, when he was here, I don't, I don't remember Chris how many kids we had at New Beginnings, but you were, you were incredible. And kid was all around him all the time. And, and I just said, thank God, because if they're around him, <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was amazing. He still is amazing. So good to have you, man. Good to have you. I'll tell you something else. Uh, <laughs> talk about watch a guy hit a softball. It's amazing how far he can hit that ball. Man. Uh, it's good to have you. Yeah. Good to have you. He's back a lot of memories. They're singing this song, and, uh, and I couldn't help just, and just to think about how good God is, how we need to stand in awe of Him, because He's God. Got to thinking about uh, just new beginnings, and I, I know there's a lot of people that aren't here. Hey, listen, welcome to the beginning of summer. Yeah. Matter of fact, next week Mother's Day at 11 o'clock, we're having one service and put both services together, and then starting in June, starting in June, first Sunday in June for June, July, and August, will be one service at 10 o'clock. Okay. Giving our teachers a break. We emailed out some uh, notices to our teachers. We, we had notices come back saying, thank God. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so June, July, and August, one service at 10 o'clock. We put everybody together. And some of you second service people are going to be introduced to the first service people. And you can see if you like them or not. I actually told the first service that too. So. We're going to have a wonderful time. Tonight, uh, out of Lake Boulevard, the church got a prophecy at 6 o'clock. There's a district fellowship meeting if you'd like to come to that. I got thinking about how we need to stand in awe of God. And I started thinking, well, why? What, what's he done? He's done different things for different people. And at New Beginnings, we... Uh, we tend to have a lot of people that come to church here. I'm not ashamed of this. We tend to have a lot of people that come to church here that try to other places and and just, you know, for lack of better words, just either didn't fit or some of some of you you didn't fit, and some of you you were told you didn't fit. <laughs> I have to know and they and they don't it's not that they're mean about it, but there's other places in our in our town where they if you don't fit, they just tell you to go to New Beginnings. We say thank you. <laughs> Some people say go to hell. Some people say go to New Beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change, right, Chris? <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. It just <laughs> got out there. I'm sorry, Lisa. Um, and sometimes what happens is, pray, Judy. You need to pray right now. What happens is sometimes is there's some people that said they look at you know New Beginnings. This <laughs> New Beginnings. Sorry, Candy. Embarrass her too. And uh, think, are you doing any good? You know. And I wanted to share with you that there is a lot of good being done 
in this part of the kingdom. Amen. Michelle's here today. And um, can I read a little bit of this? Michelle? I don't have the glasses on, so I need a real big. Is that you saying yes or crying saying, oh God, no? Okay, now you're getting hugged. And Michelle was in uh, the Samaritan house that we, we helped support. And they did an article on her. She didn't have her, didn't have her kid. You guys sit down so everybody behind you can see. Um, she's trying to get her son back, right? Michelle's child was one of being spoiled and lacking discipline. Her father died when she was six years old. Her mother sank into a deep depression because of it and never recovered. Michelle was too young and immature to fend off the negative influences of peer pressure and even family members. She was introduced to drugs before she ever started grade school. Her innocence of living with out drugs were stolen from her. In her formative years, she developed into an increasingly more dependent addict. She said drugs are mind, drugs are mind-altering. When you get high, you drink one, you try something that gives you a different high, another drug. Michelle's adult life has been marred with trouble. She fell deep into the whole daily dependent drug lifestyle. She has sporadic Employment, unstable relationships, domestic violence, no home of her own to raise her son, then lost her son to foster care because of her behavior. Samaritan then was Michelle's gateway to a new life. She said, I've never been to a shelter before. It was scary at first. I would have been positive for drugs. Now I'm clean. It was six months on Tuesday. I have, I had never been clean before, ever, not since I was 20. From age of 20 to 44, I was never clean. It's amazing. Her motivation came from wanting to get her son back. She lacked the means and the willpower. She said, I had to accept that I'm an addict. What for the Samaritan Inn, I would not have had a place to lay my head at night to support the other women. All the ladies prayed for me and heard her testimonies. They kept me from using drugs again. The rules kept me in check. I love the Samaritan end. Thankful for Susan and Vicki. Michelle went on to share what she had, has learned and who she has become. God forgives no matter what you do. Amen. He has a plan for everybody. He answers most prayers and even most little prayers. Before I was a fan, before I was a fan, now I'm a follower. After months of our chapel messages, devotional times, and counseling, Michelle went forward to an altar. Michelle went forward in an altar call I had read this in. at New Beginnings Church. She said, I want to keep my church. And I love Pastor Randy. I didn't make that up. It really is here. <laughs> because she has done so well in her time here at the mission, Michelle has regained custody of her son. Soon this reunited family, reunited family, 
to move out to independent living. She said, if it wasn't for this place, I would have no place to go. This will save my life and help me get my son back in my sobriety. For eight-year-old Justin, his mom was not really being his mom. The world was just not right. Now his world has been set right. He has a good reason to smile. The gateway to hope and happiness is open for him. So, Michelle, we are so proud. You too, Justin. <laughs> Justin. Very proud. Justin or Dustin? Justin. Thank you, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Proud of you. God bless your heart. Don't ever think that what you are investing in is the lost cause. Lives are still being changed in spite of us. Amen? Amen. Solomon, come here. I'm so proud of this. Um, now, Sullivan, you went to a meet the other day, a gymnastic meet, right? How old are you? 11 years old. And just in case you guys don't know what this is, this is called a medal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just any medal. It is a first place. Woo! Woo!
One second he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next he was sucked up, washed up, and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. <coughs> she removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang, and as she turned to answer the phone, she barely got hello out and Chippy was gone. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum cleaner, opened the bag, and there was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him, raced him to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shaking, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer <laughs> and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, this is a true story. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who initially had written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he just sits and stares. <laughs> Can imagine it. Sucked in. Washed up. Blown over. It's enough to steal anybody's song, isn't it? <laughs> Chippy had the odds stacked. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20. I promise I'm going to do my best to rush through this, but I need you to, if I'm going to talk fast, I need you to listen fast, okay? Second Chronicles chapter 20, <clears throat> verses 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. Here's what it says. I got to hurry, okay? So they rose up early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets. And you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed, we'll talk about this in a little bit, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Now, when they begin to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen to the earth, and no one had escaped. God, I need your help, as always. I probably need it more today. So please, Holy Spirit, touch us today. Change our lives through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
and they met. I believe that one of the greatest desires for the children of God, for you that are saved, and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, I believe that one of the greatest desires for you is that you would be free from fear. It's an amazing thing what fear will do to you. We have to understand, number one, that fear is the opposite of faith. Faith pleases God and fear disappoints God. Faith produces confidence, but fear produces doubt and unrest. God simply doesn't want any of you or me to live in torment because of fear. Personally, in my own life, God has shared a lot of things with Lisa and I. Some of those things happen immediately. Some of them happen in a period of time, and then there are some of those things that have not happened as of yet. What I want to share with you is this. Don't become discouraged. If God has made a promise to you, don't give up on the promise. Hang on to the promise because God will eventually walk through and take care of what he promised you. Yeah. Remember this. This is very important. Remember this, please. A prophetic word from the Lord is not a promise of what he will do. I need you to chew on that just for a second. A prophetic word from the Lord is not a promise of what he will do. A prophetic word from the Lord is a promise of what he wants to do. But you and I still have a part to play. We still have to be doing the right thing. And if fear is dominating your life, then that prophetic word will soon dry up and wither away. God has blessings and new opportunities in store for us. But to receive them, we've got to step out by faith and say, I'm going to do my part. That often means doing things that we don't really feel like doing. Anybody here ever feel like doing things that were rough? Perfect example. Luke chapter 5. You got Peter. I'm going to go this real quick. You got Peter. He's been fishing all night. They haven't got anything yet. Jesus comes up to the shore. Basically, here's what he says. Launch out. Put your nets on the other side. Peter says, excuse me. You are not a fisherman. We are a fisherman. How many of you caught? Nothing. Listen. If I'm out somewhere and I ain't catch anything, you come up to me and you offer me a different bait, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take your bait. Here's Peter saying, you're not a fisherman, we're fishermen, but I tell you what we're going to do. Because there's something about your voice, there's something about you, I'm going to do exactly what you say to do. They launch out, they put the nets on the other side, and when they do, the Bible says, there is a great catch that comes to them. Only when you obey God and do exactly what he wants you to do, will you see the fruit of what he is going to give to you. Now let me share this with you. God is looking for an attitude that says, Lord, tell me what you want me to do. I will move in that direction. I will say goodbye to the thoughts that I have, hello to the thoughts that you have, and walk into my victory. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. Some men came, and i got to hurry. Hang on. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. From the other side of the sea, it's already his own Tamar. Alarmed, a Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire. Watch this. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat inquired of the Lord. He proclaimed a fast to all of Judah. Here's the account of Jehoshaphat's dilemma. He finds himself in a horrible situation. Anybody ever been there? He's simply trying to figure out how in the world he's going to get out of this mess. I have been there at least once in my life. Where I'm trying to figure out how in the world am I going to get out of this. He wants to take a look at what he did. Number one. First thing he did. He turns to God first. I don't know why he is. As a human being, God is always the last on the list. Well, let me check with the doctor. Let me check with the banker. Let me check with my friend. Let me check. Let me check. Let me check. Okay, nobody's got any answers. God, you think you might be able to help out. He checks with God first. When Jehoshaphat was told these kings were coming against him, the first thing he did was get scared to death. I got a feeling we've been there a few times. I think some 
got, we see a problem. We say we're in trouble. But the only way you're going to get through what you're going through is you've got to hear a word from the Lord. Stop listening to everybody else and start listening to God. Hey, Pastor, how come I can't listen to sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so? You may be listening to somebody who hasn't got a hold of God. They're going to give you their opinion. Their opinion never trumps the word of God. Amen. Amen. Hello? Jehoshaphat realized that the only way he was going to get through this, he had to have some effective battle plans. Now, folks, somebody please hear this next remark. We should develop a habit of running to God. Ask yourself, the moment you get in trouble, do you run to the phone or do you run to the throne? Woo, that was good, Pastor Scroggins. That was really good. <laughs> he turns his focus on the Lord instead of on his fear of the problem. Number two, folks, who is going to hurt him? Number two, talk to God. Verse number five, said Chronicles, here's what it says. Then King Jehoshaphat went and stood before them, and he prayed aloud. He was not embarrassed to say, God is my God. When you talk to God, there's two things you need to do. Number one, remind yourself of who God is. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I only needed three there. That's good. Verse number six, are you not, here's what he said, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. He was letting God know that he knew God was bigger than the problem that was in front of him. Jehoshaphat, by reminding God, was actually building up his own faith. When I feel as though the odds are against me, I tell God how awesome he is. I remind him that he holds the universe in the palms of his hand, that there is nothing so big that he cannot do. I make up my mind when the odds are overwhelming. I'm going to talk to the one that overwhelms the odds. He doesn't matter what your problem is. God is greater than your problem. <laughs> Verse number seven, Joshua says this. Did you drive out the... I love this part here. Did you drive out those who live in this land? I need, the, I need my team back up here right now. Coach, you're going to be quick. Get your team back up. Stand in awe of you. That's what I want you to find. <laughs> Jehoshaphat says this, verse number seven. Didn't you drive out those who lived in the land when your people arrived? Now watch this. Jill, he is going all the way back to Moses. All the way back to Joshua. When the odds are against you. Remind yourself yes, what he's already done in the past. Scroggins, do you remember when this happened? And then God stepped in. Scroggins, do you remember when those things happened? And then God Randy, do you remember when you were laying in the hospital bed and the doctors got around and said, call his parents. He's never going to make it out of this alive. And then God stepped in. And he decided back then, Randy, to let you live. Place a call on your life. What makes you think he's going to let you down now? Ron, you've been through a lot. You put God through a lot. But several years ago, somehow, someway, you looked up and said, I think I now know you. And you connected with him. And he brought you out back then, son. What makes you think he's going to let you down now? <laughs> you know, in your life, the enemy's going to hit you. He's going to bring hell to your doorstep. It may be a year or two years and five. And you may come to a point where you say, God, what am I going to do? But you're going to have to remember, wait a minute. I remember a time when I didn't know if I was going to get my boy back. When God stepped in. Listen to what says. Philippians says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you would carry it on to complete. 
Jesus and to the day of Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are or where you have been. I don't care how many times you've walked out of God. I've done that myself. I don't care how many times you've turned your back. If you just call on Him, I have good news for you. God still has the same calling in His hand.
How do we know the Lord's going to be good? The Lord is good and His mercy endures me forever. Pastor, why at times, and I admit I can be, why are you so strict on your worship? Why do you worry so much about what they wear, how they sound? Why? I'll tell you why. Jehoshaphat realized, in order to win this battle, I've got to move him. And there is something about God and music apparently he likes. When Saul was in trouble, he called for David. David came and played the harp. Chased evil spirits. These guys and girls, they lead us to the throne. Your miracles is at the throne. It's not as a preacher. You gotta get to God. They were singing about what they could not see in order to go where they had not been. Really didn't get that. A new beginning. For us to get where we're supposed to go, we're going to have to believe in what we have not seen. We begin to profess. The Lord is good. His mercy. <laughs> Turn to God first. Talk to God. Learn how to thank God. Years ago, 
I used to box. Years ago, don't be coming and talking to me about it now. Years ago, and I learned something. You come in with your head down, they come up with a right hook. It's painful. You got to keep your head up. Every single one of you in here, more, a lot, I don't even know who your names are, a lot of you. But I'm telling you, if you want to win, if you want to get where God wants you to get, you better keep your head up and know that God has a future for you. He's going to do the miraculous for you. And when everybody else says, you're never going to make it, God said, get your head up and look where I'm taking you. Yeah. 